ladies and gentlemen, can we start? Distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. On behalf of the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation, it is my pleasure to give the opening remarks to this event on sharing knowledge to deliver effective development cooperation. This is one of the thematic themes being prepared leading up to the ministerial or the high-level meeting to be held in Mexico in April 2014 by the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation. The Global Partnership, as mandated post-Busan, is based on inclusivity, which is uh, involving wider participation of all stakeholders, not only government. It is also based on evidence-based uh, policies, programs, and activities, which will lead to development effectiveness as opposed to a mere uh, aid effectiveness. The, the question posed now is why knowledge sharing? Why knowledge sharing? Because successful development outcome is built on workable, effective development policies and programs. Many developing countries, including those that have become emerging countries, I'm sure have many concrete development policies and programs that are successful. That would be of tremendous benefit if these experiences, lessons learned, as well as best practices can be shared to their peers, uh, the fellow uh, developing countries. Uh, certainly, yeah, the more detailed one, I will share with you several of the case studies and so on uh, later on during the discussion session. In the, dis in the discussion, we will also hear how this knowledge sharing initiative can then be scaled up in its participation as well as in its implementation. I believe through knowledge sharing, the multifaceted objectives can be reached, which are where we can get the best practices, lessons learned from various countries, and then we can best fit the best practices and the lessons learned from other countries to benefit yeah, the developing countries concerned. As well as, and then we can discuss further and follow up further on how to have an effective development cooperation invo involving uh, the other uh, very important stakeholders, yeah, aside from the government, uh, which are our uh, colleagues in the private sectors, foundations, multilateral as well as bilateral development partners. Again, uh, thank you very much for your participation and looking forward to a very useful and interactive discussion. Now I would like to turn the opportunity to uh, Sanjay Pradhan from the World Bank Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. Uh, uh, welcome to all of you uh, to the World Bank uh, Group. Um, I'm very, very pleased to host this event uh, together with the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation, led by Indonesia, Nigeria, and the UK, and uh, the o and uh, and also together with the OECD, I want to begin with an example, if I may, an example that can demonstrate the value and power of knowledge ex knowledge sharing and knowledge exchange, and how it can be a very relevant instrument uh, for helping achieve the goals that our governors have set for us. Um, and, and we are discussing the strategy in the development committee meetings right after this meeting. So in January 2010, a massive earthquake, as you know, uh, hit uh, Haiti, and it crippled the garment industry of Haiti, which is responsible for 88% of its export and is the largest source of the country's employment. Faced with this tremendous challenge, uh, even though Haiti was getting aid, it wanted to figure out knowledge and experience of how to reconstruct its, its garment industry. So Haiti turned to Brazil and Korea, which are proven to have very good competitive policies uh, in, the, in the garment industry. Through the South-South uh, facility that actually Ngozi Konjo Iwala had set up, when she was managing director here in the World Bank Group, we facilitated a South-South exchange between uh, Haiti, Korea, and Brazil. 
And this helped uh, Haiti uh, share, um, uh, Brazil and Korea share experiences on how to set up policies for uh, increasing garment exports, but also how to integrate Haiti in the international supply chain. As a consequence of this, Haiti became introduced to key uh, buyers and players in the international uh, garment supply chain. And it was introduced as a destination for investment. As a consequence of this knowledge exchange, five Korean firms invested in Haiti, uh, increasing its exports, and it immediately generated new jobs. This is one small example. I'm sure colleagues around this table will have many such examples. The question for us is, we have met in various meetings and known the power of knowledge exchange. The question for us is how can we take it to the next level? How can we take it to the next level so it's scaled up and mainstreamed in development activities so we can actually unleash this transformative power of knowledge exchange? And if you can think of it, if countries can, exp uh, can share experiences, those who have been successful with those who are struggling with similar problems, we can have a concrete impact in the lives of the poor, just as we had in the lives of the poor in Haiti through the generation of jobs and increase in garment uh, exports. So with this, I just wanted to close my introductory remarks and say that as we head for the ministerial meeting in Mexico in April 2014, we should set for ourselves a target, a target from this meeting and beyond on how we can create, how we can scale and mainstream knowledge exchange and development activities and set for ourselves some measurable targets so we actually go to the next level. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Femi Ok. I am going to be the moderator from Qing now and a one o'clock. So I'm looking forward to having a conversation with you. Now, I have to tell you that you've given up your Saturday and I'm very impressed. I'm going to make it worth your while or you are going to make it worth your while because we are talking about knowledge sharing, not knowledge telling. And I can tell in this room there are people who make fantastic speeches. I can tell that. I can just, I'm looking at you. You're taking notes already. This is very impressive. We are not doing any knowledge telling today. Panel, <laughs> guests in the room, we are actually knowledge sharing. So you can relax, you can put away your prepared statements and listen and really share your knowledge of your country, your region, your organization, because this global partnership, it only works if we really share our knowledge. The conversation is not just in this room. I can see some of you have your phones out. This is a good time to put your phone on silence. I'm not telling you to turn it off because I know you're gonna be live tweeting this and there's a hashtag. <laughs> there's a hashtag. There's a hashtag I know you're going to need. Knowledge sharing, all one word. Hashtag knowledge sharing. And then we can all have that conversation as a Twitter conversation, as well as here in the room. Also, there's a Twitter feed that you need to be following as well to see what we're officially tweeting, and that is at G-P-E-D-C. So at G-P-E-D-C. So here's the plan. We are going to talk. We are going to share our knowledge with our panel. I'm also going to be keeping an eye on the rest of the room to see when you have questions. We will start taking those at about 12.30. But if I feel I see a really, really great question, I might just be tempted to go to it sooner rather than later. We have microphones here, but we also have people working the microphones. So I will be looking out for you. I don't have eyes in the back of my head, so occasionally I will be looking at the back of the room here. You do have my best side, this side of the room, so congratulations. <laughs> so I'll be looking back here as well. So let's start with our knowledge sharing by introducing you to the panel. Now you've already heard from Dr. Amida Alishbana. She's the Minister of National Development Planning in Eden, Indonesia. Dr. Sanjay Pradhan, can you tell us your official title? I'm the Vice President for Change, Knowledge and Learning at the World Bank Group. That's nice. He's even got knowledge in his title. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> you can stay. Dr. Maria Kewanuka, please reach over to the microphone. Tell us what your official title is. See, this is me just practicing that you can get to the microphone. You sound good before we start our okay. big conversation. Your official title, Minister. 
at um, the Minister for Finance, Planning, and Economic Development in Uganda, which is another way of saying the buck stops with me. Nice. <laughs> Good person to have in the room. Dr. Philip Shonrock, your official title. Good morning. Good morning. I'm the director of Sepay, a Colombian-based think tank. Excellent. Ms. Yungu Oh, your official title, please. Good morning, everybody. I'm the director general for development cooperation in Korean foreign ministry. And you're very welcome. Are you feeling curious this morning? Yeah, oh, very much. Good answer. <laughs> The only answer I will accept. Uh, Ms. Gargi Ghosh, welcome. Your official title, please. Good morning, uh, Director of Policy and Finance at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Okay, we are going to start with this panel, but we're going to make the conversation spread around the room as well. And also amongst yourself, the best conversations we're going to have is amongst all of you asking questions as well, digging a little deeper. So let's start, though, with the Minister of Finance, the buck stops here in Uganda. and ask you really what does knowledge sharing mean for you in Uganda? Can you explain? Um, if I put it into the international context, which is you know what, what we're looking at here, um, I think knowledge sharing to me means any non-cash transfer. I mean we hear a lot about cash transfers you know in the in the course of our development work and financial work. But knowledge sharing I think is just as important, even more important. Uh, by sharing knowledge, you're living the old Chinese adage of, you know, if you teach a um, person to fish, you've sh shared the knowledge. But if you just give them a fish, then you're giving them aid. So it's very important to us in Uganda because human resource development is one of our key, uh, key objectives. So when you talk about the idea of aid, would you say that knowledge sharing was instead of aid or as well as aid? No, I think it's, they go together because while you're teaching a person to fish, they need to eat uh, w while they're learning. Um, I think knowledge sharing helps us uh, by, if you impart knowledge and someone imbibes it, they become more value added, if you like. They can operate at a higher level of, of, of productivity. And um, it helps a sustain, a sustain initiatives that if someone helps you set up a factory, for instance, uh, and you teaches your people how to operate it, as we're hearing uh, what happened in Haiti uh, with Korea. After they leave, you can operate the factory, and then you're into the sustainable development that we, we all talk about. So I, I think it's, it's a vital component of aid in order to make sure aid translates into something that is sustainable and, and, and can stand on its own. So right here now, I'm hearing a lot of generalization. I've been to Uganda, I love Uganda, and I'm not hearing specifics. Is this because this partnership is so young? Have you even tried knowledge sharing in Uganda? I'm trying to envisage what it would look like. Have you attempted it? Or is this on your to-do list? Uh, no, it's, I, I think maybe I'm being general because there's just so many examples pick, pick one. Of, of knowledge sharing, both official and unofficial. For instance, last year, I went to uh, Indonesia on a, on a knowledge sharing uh, 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 seminar. And when I was there, I got in touch with uh, the ministers from Mexico and the minister of uh, agriculture from Brazil and found out about a uh, tropical institution in, in Brazil that deals in tropical uh, products, uh, tropical crops, and that is already working in, in Mozambique and Ghana and I think Senegal. So I said, fine, can we have some kind of exchange uh, come up between Uganda and Brazil? Now. Here's the downside, we're still working on it, but the opportunity came to me then when I was at the Knowledge Sharing uh, Seminar. Vice President Pradhan, you were writing notes just now. What did you write? <laughs> I was writing that she's tough. <laughs> no, so I was writing what are some ways in which we can actually take this to the next level, which is the challenge I see. So you hear examples like the one in Uganda, uh, and you hear the examples that you hear the ones in, in Haiti. And the question really for us is, how do you take this to scale? That is the challenge I, 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 was, I was posing. And I have some ideas on that which I can share when the time comes, but I'd much rather hear from my other colleagues first. Note to self, get back for the ideas. Okay, Philip, talking about civil society, 
with you. I know that's something that's pretty important for you. And that whole idea of South-South cooperation. Take us there. Can you help us understand it a little better and how it might work? Well, at least I will try now. Um, I believe South-South cooperation, we have to ask ourselves for what, for whom, and how to do it. Uh, and in the first place, we have to see to open innovation, open governments and open data and knowledge. In the innovation, it strikes me every time when we talk about development that we have all businesses are able to do innovation, but we're not able to do it and try uh, in the development side. On the government uh, part, I believe it is very important that we actually have private-public partnerships on South-South cooperation. And what we're seeing there is that civil society and governments are actually not having the right structures to do so or actually not implementing them. On the open data part, I believe there we still have a lot to do how to transform data into knowledge and lessons learned and how we actually transfer those. So I believe at the first point it is important how we structure a relationship between civil society and governments and multilateral organizations on those four parts. How would you suggest we structure it? This is, this is the whole point of the global partnership. It's setting up best practices. <laughs> Philip's <laughs> smiling, he's like, oh, why did I say yes to this panel? <laughs> because this is great if we're all picking each other's brains. It's like, okay, so for Mexico next year, we might be able to work out from what Philip told us in October, how to structure it or give us a start. What would you, what would you do? Well, that's a tough one for two minutes answer, but uh, I will try to do my best. Uh, I think we need a holistic approach, uh, not only based on knowledge transfer, but we also need how we transfer science and technology, which is part of, of the knowledge. But my main question here is, is the South ready to cooperate with the South? And there we have a main issue, and my answer is yes, but we need to have a holistic approach with all development actors there, uh, and especially management for development results on a South-South cooperation basis. I know I'm not giving you all the answers, I'm giving you hints there where I think we should go uh, and what we should do with South-South cooperation. And this holistic approach, when we see South-South uh, not only uh, between our actors in the region but outside, we have main problems. We need to finance South-South cooperation and we need to go to our parliaments and ask them to give money. And when we're going now in Colombia or in any country uh, in Latin America to our parliaments and tell our parliamentarians we need money to cooperate with other countries in the region, they think, wait, aid, it's about receiving. Uh, why should we give now money? Uh, we have our own problems uh, in the region. So there's where we actually have something to build on, uh, and we have to face those new problems as well. I see what you said resonated with some people on the panel, and some people off the panel. I'm going to go off the panel. I'm going to head to Mexico to talk to Mauricio Escancero. Mauricio, would you introduce yourself? Because you were nodding and when we were talking about South-South cooperation and is the South ready to cooperate, uh, it's really interesting to hear what you have to say. Thank you. I'm Mauricio Escanero. I'm a member of the Mexican team uh, organizing the high-level meeting of the Global Partnership on Effective, effective Development Cooperation in Mexico. And um, uh, commenting on what uh, my friend in my right has said, um, I, I think that uh, knowledge sharing is not only an important modality of uh, South-South uh, cooperation, uh, knowledge sharing is uh, also an important element of North-South cooperation or South-North cooperation and, um, and multi-stakeholder cooperation. So um, uh, the question is, is the, we are ready to uh, um, provide South-South cooperation. I think that what we should be already is to provide international development cooperation in partnership, in partnership from all quarters, from the public and private sector. And uh, in the particular case of countries like Mexico, a middle-income uh, country, we have to also to understand the dual character of, of our countries as both recipient uh, of international development cooperation and also as providers of international cooperation. And there are uh, uh, extremely important opportunities uh, for triangular cooperation, by which the expertise of co uh, countries like, like mine and, and others in, 
other middle income countries can be mobilized in partnership schemes that also uh, ca uh, count with the support, the financial support of uh, more, more advanced economies and uh, uh, other stakeholders, and that we can uh, provide south-south cooperation to those in more need. And the, the scope of this international level of cooperation, actually, it is uh, absolutely uh, uh, um, holistic, should be, because uh, we can talk from uh, international development cooperation for infrastructure, for social development, for institutional uh, building and policy setting, as he was mentioned already before, from basic social service to education, to all areas in which we can find opportunities. And the Mexico meeting will be an opportunity to uh, both uh, see how we can implement Busan uh, commitments, to see how we can give further impetus and give, uh, um, provide a showcase of opportunities on, on, on these areas and to look forward for uh, contributing to the Agenda for Development uh, post-2015. What's the cost? Is it expensive? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, all um, uh, the, the actual uh, cost of a, a, a conference, uh, it is an, an expensive um, effort, but the real um, investment on this kind of efforts is not uh, circumscribed to the realization of an event. You were pointing out about what is on the ground, what is happening on the ground. And what we are uh, looking forward is to provide in Mexico an opportunity for relaunching this global partnership, uh, action-oriented partnership that can make a difference on how effective the Benoit cooperation is being understood and is being implemented around the world. So uh, what we are calling in Mexico is for the contribution of everybody with knowledge, with resources, and most importantly, with commitment to action uh, to deliver what we are expected to do in terms of international development cooperation. And let me bring Youngju into the conversation. If we look at South Korea in, in development, we're, we're looking at a, a really very successful story there and role models. So if we're talking about sharing, the sharing goes both ways. What would South Korea have to offer the rest of the world? What's, what's your expertise? What would you gladly share? Yeah, um, uh, first of all, that I really thank you, the, uh, Mr. Prada, to citing this Korea's case in, in terms of the high tea. Actually, you know, uh, Korea you know, the, has accumulated a lot of experience throughout our, the uh, 40 case of the development process, but we cannot share everything with our developing countries. It's impossible. So from the, uh, the, the perspective of the provider of the knowledge to the South, I think it's quite important to uh, you know, to identify our comparative advantage. This is really important thing. Is you know, there are, we can see that a lot of the I mean the other South countries involved in this knowledge sharing program. So there might be some overlapping as well as some defragmentation. So when we provide this kind of the knowledge to other I mean the developing countries, we wanna to stick on our comparative advantage. That is, we just share some kind of the policies related to the economic issues, or we really focusing on the sharing uh, you know, the, our uh, knowledge and experiences, the uh, boosting some institutional mechanism. The backbone of the Korea's, I mean, the development, the fast development is the owe to the uh, very solid institution of Korea, the governance system. So we are to share those kind of ideas with the other countries. That is, the, I mean, the main elements of our knowledge sharing program and the activities in Korea. Thank you. That's very pragmatic. I love that very pragmatic approach. I'm going to give you this, but I want this in return. What countries are you looking at? Where are you looking around the world going, ooh, they would be useful for us to have a partnership with? Actually, when we provide this kind of assistance, you know, you want to see some kind of very contextual, the cultural aspect too. So something happen, happen in Korea cannot happen automatically in other countries. So I think the cultural elements as well as the contextual elements are really important. And that's why we are focused on Asian countries. We have a lot of similarities in Asia. So Vietnam, Myanmar, those are the real the best case. We make some kind of promise on the ground there with the I mean, same input. But the, you know, frankly speaking, you know, the, some, some countries in other continent, you know, it's quite difficult to 
have those kind of the similar, I mean, the, you know, the, the result on the ground. So that, that's kind of the very important element when we go into the specific the policy, I mean, the, the knowledge sharing the change program. Again, that's very candid. I like that. Before you pass the microphone back, I just come back. <laughs> I just want to know specifics. Give me one example. Have you tried knowledge sharing yet, or are we just talking about it and you're going to do it? Give me no. an example. We, we have involved in knowledge sharing, I mean, the activities for the last two decades, you know. We have a lot of the experience and the outcomes in many countries. Also, we have some of the failures, too. Every try cannot be a success. So we need to focus on the, some failures when we are sharing our knowledge with other countries. So Korea is ready to share with our failures with other South providers in, in context of South-South cooperation. So I can ask you a very specific, I mean, cases already, Mr. Prado, talking about the Haiti cases. We have so many cases in Vietnam. You know, we are now going to build up some of the, uh, the institutions there. They, so that's why I will, give, I will email you. <laughs> you need to email the room. <laughs> I think that was a, I'll get back to you on that one, Femi. But uh, Vice President Pradhan, I know you were wanting to jump in there. Um, you know, the, the Korean case is a very good example of the limits, but also the possibilities of scaling up, uh, sharing knowledge at scale. So if you think of Korea, as you were saying, uh, Femi, right? Femi. Is it Femi? It is Femi. Okay. So Femi, uh, as you were saying that- And my last name is OK, so you've got it perfectly right. <laughs> so Korea is such an interesting case because it is one country that has traversed the distance from developing to developed. And so there's such a huge interest in Korea's experience. And as you heard from Ms. Oh, it's going to be hard for Korea to itself share its knowledge with all those many countries, uh, Femi, that you were asking about that, that are interested. So there are two suggestions which is part of this second stage of knowledge sharing, where we go beyond that it's good and we can do it a little bit here and there. So I, when I visited Korea, uh, the, one of the Korean officials who was in charge of knowledge sharing was mentioning how difficult it is for them to share knowledge with so many other countries, because it's a small office, and how do you do that? So one of the initiatives we started actually in Bali under uh, Minister Amida's uh, leadership uh, was a conference which involved 46 countries, many middle-income countries, but also low-income countries, where the initiative was how do you develop knowledge hubs in the countries, which are a way to package the knowledge, organize the knowledge, and then help share it at scale, right? So that in case lots of countries want to learn from Korea, uh, Korea doesn't have to individually go to each country and so on, but you actually wholesale the knowledge exchange. And this has been quite an interesting experience because 46 countries came there. There was enormous drive and energy. And as a result, uh, there is a community of practice for knowledge hubs, country-led knowledge hubs that has been formed. And for those of you who want to join this, you can, you can let us know. Uh, that would be quite an interesting experience. Uh, we are actually working on a pilot basis with, I think, Brazil, Colombia, Nigeria, and Indonesia on how to help countries develop these knowledge hubs so that you take, whether it's ABES, to give you an example, ABES, which is a water association in Brazil, how do you take that? There's a lot of interest in learning from that. How you do you take that, package it, and scale it, uh, scale it up uh, quite a bit? So that's just an example of, of taking it to scale. Has anybody in this room heard of a knowledge? Knowledge Hub. The panel can't say yes, but any anybody else heard of a Knowledge Hub? Show of hands, no. Would you like, oh, a few. Okay, very good. Okay, so most of this room have no idea what a Knowledge Hub is. Give us an example. Let's say Nigeria. Could Nigeria be a, a Knowledge Hub? Yes, but you would go a little bit, of definitely, but go a little bit deeper within Nigeria. So I'll give you an example of, the, of, the, of a concrete case that we're working on, which is Brazil's ABES, which is a water, water association of Brazil. A lot of interest in learning about that. So the Knowledge Hub becomes taking ABES and organizing its knowledge, packaging it, turning it into multimedia type stories and so on. Also backing up, as Minister Amida was saying, the evidence on what has worked, under which circumstances it has worked. And so the Knowledge Hub really becomes a collection of that knowledge and a nodal point of practitioners in Brazil who are available to share that knowledge with others. 
So, Minister Kawanuka, what would you feel you would need for Uganda? What knowledge hub would you specifically seek out? Well, I'd, I think I'd like to do something based on our competitive advantages, as uh, we heard from Korea. Our competitive advantage is in agriculture. Our competitive advantage is in tourism. So I would like to get together with countries that had agricultural uh, uh, success stories, that will, had tourism success stories, and see how to learn from them, but then they also learn from us. I, th I think one starts with where one is a com has a competitive advantage and, and leapfrog on that. So here's the practicality. So like an event like this, you're all having bilateral meetings. It's wonderful to see you turn up here on time because I know you've got so many different bilateral meetings and that's how you do business. But how would you do business where you're working for a knowledge hub? That's, that's it. You're expecting to do business in a slightly different way. How is that going to work? I know we're still in the early stages. Have you thought it through? I think so. <laughs> I think you, you can take that one. OK, so one way to look at it is that the Knowledge Hub is preparing the supply side of knowledge, quite simply. It's the people who will supply the knowledge, like Korea, like Brazil Abes, like Uganda Agriculture, Uganda Tourism. Uh, tourism. You're organizing that institution to be able to scale its knowledge, right? But then your question, Femi, is that how do you go beyond the bilateral into a multilateral? So I can only share with you two examples of how we as a multilateral platform, the World Bank Group, can help share that knowledge at scale. So one way we can do this is through our own operations. So in the World Bank Group, we finance a lot of countries. We, we help a lot of governments. For those governments that are looking for water sector reform, and we are supporting them in water sector reform, we can pluck the example from Brazil, which is scalable, and we can share it at scale. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we did an event with, uh, with, uh, with, um, with Jimmy Carter on right to information in Ghana. And Jimmy Carter's uh, institution gets a lot, of inf a lot of requests on right to information. But once you use a multilateral platform, you collect 30 countries that can learn at scale. So that's an example of how you use a multilateral platform to connect at scale and then using institutions like the World Bank Group, other, other partners, UNDP, uh, other institutions, you, know, you can, you can uh, share it at scale. Phil? OK. Tell me. <laughs> I could tell you needed to add something to the conversation. I'm a student of body language. OK, sounds good. Uh, and you were right. Yes, uh, I was actually asking myself when we were talking about knowledge hubs and how to transfer knowledge. Because we usually talk about case studies, write them down, but we write a lot in a region that doesn't read a lot. So we need actually to change how to transfer knowledge, visualization processes, how to transform that lessons learned or data into a visualization process in how to actually engage stakeholders in the field. Because when you go back with the whole book and tell them, hey, this is a great, a great experience from Brazil, Indonesia, or any other country, and we go back to the field, people do not understand it and do not know how to take into account that knowledge and make something out of it. So that's my big question here about how to transfer that knowledge because we have the knowledge. But now the point and my main concern is how do we actually transfer it? That's a fantastic question. Oh my goodness, that's literally why we're here. So one of the co-hosts of the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation is Minister Ali Shabana. I mean, you really push for knowledge sharing to be in this global partnership. So if Philip is asking you how, what would you say back to him? Uh, I think uh, I will uh, develop further from what uh, Sanjay already explained. Yeah. So uh, what are the key components uh, to scale up this uh, knowledge sharing initiatives yeah, if we want really to make it uh, more effective. I have uh, jotted down yeah, uh, the key key factors. Uh, I believe there are four. One is on the theme or uh, topics, uh, specific topics that uh, can be developed through this knowledge sharing, the substance on the th uh, th thematic areas. 
whether it's poverty elevation, whether it's rural infrastructure development, agriculture, and things like that. Yeah, it's not only I think it's not only confined to uh, economic or social welfare issues, but it can go beyond that. For example, in the case of Indonesia, uh, we are also advancing uh, the issue of governance and uh, peace and security. Uh, you you can read it as quote unquote, including uh, the issue of uh, democratization. And then second is uh, on the brokerage mechanism. Uh, Sanjay uh, explained that uh, what we've been doing is by using the existing platform, because institutions such as World Bank through the World Bank Institute has already this existing platform. So we do not uh, need to to reinvent the wheel, yeah, uh, so to speak. And then third uh, factor is on the country-led knowledge hub infrastructure, uh, because there are already several countries that has announced and launched as the so-called uh, global country-led uh, knowledge hub, including Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, therefore, we have to certainly prepare yeah, the infrastructure, for example, on the toolkit and, and things like that. And the fourth uh, factor is on the funding activities. So we may as well utilize yeah, the existing uh, funding resources from uh, the development partners uh, through the so-called triangular uh, cooperation, as well as from, from the various foundations. So maybe that's the uh, which I, I, I see yeah, the uh, four uh, key factors. So this whole idea of South-South cooperation, knowledge sharing, it, it really looks at maybe the way that developing countries are emerging in a different way, the way that they're moving up to being middle economies rather than low economies. So if you look at things like brokering and matching demand to supply, are you thinking you have to do this differently now? It's, it's already in the works, yeah. But the question is how to make it more systematic uh, to scale up as an initiative, yeah. It's already in existence, in existence actually. Have you heard anything so far that surprised you? Uh, we've, we've been doing this. Uh, if I may, yeah, can I give you one concrete example? Yeah? I love concrete right, examples. Yeah. So, uh, in the case of Indonesia, we've been doing, uh, for for example, yeah, one concrete example is on a poverty elevation program. We have this quite a popular program, which is called uh, PNPM Mandiri, which is uh, the com community empowerment, uh, poverty elevation. So the way we do this knowledge sharing uh, program or activity is by inviting uh, the country, uh, selected country, uh, which is which is interested in this program. For example, uh, we've hosted uh, Haiti and then Afghanistan, yeah, uh, and and various other countries, and we invited them to Indonesia. Uh, we invited them to have discussion with the policymakers at the central level as well as the local level. We invited them to see uh, in the field yeah, the, the implementation of this program and then how to so-called best fit yeah, if they are interested. So earlier on this morning, I was talking to various members of the panel and I was talking to Gargi Ghosh. She was very honest. She said, I wasn't going to turn up. <laughs> Gargi, do you want to tell us why you weren't going to turn up and then why you did? Not because it's Saturday. Um, thank you. Uh, well, I have to admit, when the invitation first came in, I, I looked at it and I thought, well, we're, we're not in the business of knowledge sharing. Um, we're in the business of polio eradication or um, fortifying soy sauce to reduce malnutrition. Um, and it took me a while to turn it on its head and, and turn our business on its head and sort of say, well, actually, maybe the generation of knowledge uh, as a public good is the most sustainable uh, leave-behind thing that we as a foundation could do. Um, I, can I keep going? <laughs> yeah, you've only just started. Go for so, it. So I, I have to admit, the panel um, has made me think about sort of two different kinds of knowledge, and I think we as an institution are pretty good or trying to be pretty good at one and we, like the rest of the world, are sort of struggling on the other. So the first is knowledge breakthroughs. Somebody mentioned innovation. We're trying to be really good at that. We're trying to figure out um, the pathway of the HIV virus in your body and how to create a vaccine to fight infection for the first time. Um, 
uh, and, and we're doing that in a way that's conscious of the sharing that will need to happen. You know, our funding requires eventual products to be created at cost or at affordable cost for the developing world. Uh, so, so that's sort of the breakthrough innovation side. Um, I think what we're less good at is the process knowledge. How do you do something again and again and again or at bigger and bigger scale? And um, th that's harder to capture. It's harder to share. That's what we're talking about here. And it does strike me that, um, you know, we've, we've all got the same set of tools peer to peer. Now we're all excited about massive online courses. But how you actually capture and share process knowledge, I think, is a really hard thing that we're going to need to solve to get this, this right. I'm just going to remind people that you're with the Gates Foundation, and one of the things that the Global Partnership wants to do is to actually attract more businesses, more organizations, not just countries, not just ministers of finance, as much as we love them. It, it has to be broader to actually work. So you are going to have questions. I'm sure you have questions just from listening this morning, the knowledge hubs, the knowledge sharing, all of that. This is a great moment because what what you don't understand is really helpful for us as a partnership. So who do you have questions for? Well, I've got one question, and I'll take answers from whoever wants to offer them. <laughs> um, you know, I think one of the hardest things as a funder uh, is how you describe and understand the impact, the results of knowledge sharing. And I think especially as funders are more and more constrained, focused on results, et cetera, we have to find a good way of answering this question. Um, let me give you an example. One of the most exciting knowledge sharing forums I've, I've had the good luck to fund um, is a, a think tank funders forum. We fund the think tank initiative. It's a collection of 45 or 50 different think tanks around the developing world. They had a forum last Christmas, last December, uh, brought together heads of the think tank. I mean, it was incredible to sort of see the kinds of things, common challenges these organizations faced. How do you build? research capacity, how do you influence government, and, and, the, and the learning was sort of tangible. But if you look at a proposal for that event, you're paying for a bunch of airline tickets and uh, you know a conference facility, and that's not what funders like to fund, or not funders like us. Um, so how do you talk about, how do we describe the benefits of knowledge sharing in a way that resonates with the reality of these times? Sanjay. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't realize that was the hot seat, did you? <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is something we, we worry about quite a bit uh, because we know that there is a power to this um, as, as, the, as the audience, as the number of people around the room attest that there's a real power to this. But then how do you measure the results and, and, and how do you measure the benefits? So we have developed a, a framework, a results framework for knowledge sharing. Uh, and it's in a guidebook which is called The Art of Knowledge Exchange. Do we have any copies of it here? We can, we can provide it to whoever's interested. Laurent, can you raise your hand? Anyone who's interested, we can provide it. And if I can just quickly explain what it is. Um, it, it, it's called The Art of Knowledge Exchange. It has a results framework. And there are, uh, there are end results, like in the Haiti example I gave, the end result is Korean firms invested in Haiti. So that's an end result. But the fact is that in order to get that end result, there are intermediate results that lead to that end result. So one thing we have done is we have unpacked the chain of results into a set of, I think it's eight intermediate outcomes. And what we do is we have a trust fund which was established under Ngozi, which is called the South-South Facility. It's a very interesting facility. If some of you want to hear about it, I can tell you later. But we track the results of 136 knowledge exchanges that we have funded amongst 80 countries. And what are the results of those? And it includes from starting from awareness building to the formulation of policy, to implementation of policy, to the actual results. And it actually helps you trace and document the results of it over a period of time. And we have actually a website with a visual which actually you can click on a particular um, knowledge exchange and see who demanded it, who provided it, and what were the results. Gagi, is that persuasive? Or would it be persuasive for your funders? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's, what it was making me think is, gosh, on that first kind of knowledge innovation, we're super patient, right? We don't expect to have an HIV vaccine tomorrow or three years from now. And yet on this other kind of knowledge, knowledge sharing, 
somehow that patience doesn't transfer over. We want to see results a, a year from now or a quarter from now. And, and what you're describing, Sanjay, I think is reframing that to be a slightly longer view on the results that you can expect from this. I'm going to bring in Eric Soheim into this conversation, but Eric, hold tight for a moment, because I do want to tell the room that I'm opening up this conversation to the room. Let me just see where there might be questions. I want to make sure the microphone is in the right place. Okay, can you come a little bit forward? Hello, with the microphone. You can use the microphone. What's your name? Claire Condon. All right, there's Claire. Claire, will you wander around and catch people's eye? Hopefully you're a student of body language too. Don't have to be ready yet. Oh, look, Claire, right over here. Okay, we're gonna make Claire work very hard, but not yet. Thanks, Claire. All right, so we're gonna be opening up for, for questions. But Eric, would you tell us what you do? And then I know you needed to jump into this conversation. Go ahead. Well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm the, <clears throat> the chair of the OSD Doctor Development Assistance Committee of the OSD, but let me leave, leave that. I, th I think, I mean, true foundations are not uh, very eager to fund knowledge sharing, but governments are quite ready to share this. So here there is a division of work. I was the minister in Norway for many, many years. By far the most demanded development program was, of Norway was called Oil for Development, which was sharing the experience of what we consider a very successful oil and gas uh, sector in Norway. That's North-South cooperation for sure, not South-South, but it's basically at, at its core the same. But if, if you allow me, after I've been listening very much to this, I think extremely interesting conversation, much more, I have to say, much more interesting than I thought uh, coming here. But uh, what is the challenge? The challenge is the following. Th we are living in a time where there is no lack of knowledge. To the contrary, I mean, if you pick up this iPad, you make a, c a, c a couple of uh, t touches there, you can get one billion article about articles about every topic between uh, heaven and earth, every topic. I mean, say you are the minister in Uganda, you want to know something about tourism, you can get everything here. What is the challenge is to get the relevant information, the good practices, the best examples, the mistakes to learn from and to connect to the right people. And then we need hubs and we need brokers, we need some, some place to go to qualify all this overload uh, of information. And the uh, World Bank is doing a lot there and we, we need to do more. And if you allow me also the, the negative. Uh, we are now in an institution, World Bank, who has been giving, uh, sh doing knowledge sharing for 50 years. But some of the knowledge share was wrong. <coughs> Not all was right. Can you and, give us uh, an example? Yeah, for sure. And a number of the advices giving, given to governments. I mean, I came here, I'll give you one very practical example. I just came from an event on tax evasion in developing nations, or, or tax evasion in general. The gentleman from Zambia there spoke about the privatization of the copper sector in Zambia, telling that it was done in the wrong way. If, we, if anyone wanted to go back and look into the World Bank advice to the government of Zambia those days, I'm not <coughs> certain it would be a very positive picture. But the issue is not, not to dwell on this example, but the fact that knowledge sharing can be in most cases for good. But you can, if you share the wrong knowledge, if you pick the wrong example, if you learn from, if you don't learn from it in the right way, and knowledge is not always good. Uh, there is no for sure recipe to avoid the, the bad knowledge or the wrong knowledge, but we, transparency is a part of it. But we, we must also take that in, into our conversation. So I'm going to open up for questions from everybody. I know there's one here. I actually, am panel as well. I mean, I don't want you sitting next to someone who's got the answer and you're not gonna ask them. So actually this is for everybody. And uh, I'm also, Claire will also be able to see be back there as well. So hopefully there'll be lots of questions. So let's start here. Claire, you can see the others and, and uh, tell us who you are. And remember, no knowledge telling, knowledge sharing. Okay, uh, mine, mine actually is a question. Uh, my name is Marcus Freitas, I'm from Brazil. I'm glad that you're mentioning a case there, but I wanted to know one thing about knowledge sharing. How do you go from the national layer to the subnational layers? Because that's where actually many of the things are going to be implemented. And that's what I, what I wanted to find out. What are the policies that are being developed so that it's not stuck only at the national level, but you actually reach the bottom where it's going to make a difference? Who wants to take that? Yes, okay. 
So I, I think the principle should be that you're looking for knowledge sharing amongst relevant entities. So the example I gave from Brazil is uh, amongst, let's say, water uh, associations and so on. But you have associations of subnational entities that are created just to share experience at that level. So uh, I don't know if someone can tell me what's the full form of NALAS. Who knows NALAS full form? Someone know? OK. So anyone here? It's, uh, so it's, a, it's an association in uh, Central and Eastern Europe of local government associations below the, na below the national level who are created precisely to share experiences at a subnational level. There are lots of mayors groups. There are lots of different types of uh, subnational entities that are created to share their knowledge. So I think I wouldn't focus on this as a national level knowledge exchange. In fact, it's most useful if it is at a decentralized level and if it's at a particular, when you're trying to solve a particular problem, you share that knowledge at that entity level. Okay, we have microphones two sides of the room, uh, one with Claire, one with Ms. Moser, and your question, who are you? Yeah, Before my you name question. is Aldena Mellin, I'm with the IFC and I head the Secretariat of the Private Sector Building Block post Busan. I just wanted to come in with a few examples from what donors and private sector actors have done on what we okay, do not, okay, sorry, funny okay, don't call knowledge sharing, but we call it best practice or good practice. In the past 15, 20 years maybe, lots of donors and private sector companies, businesses have come together to share knowledge on how we partner, what we do, what kind of development impact we achieve. There's lots out there, but we don't call it knowledge sharing. We call it best practice, good practice, and try to learn from our failures. I can give you examples of a couple of websites that you might call knowledge hubs. One is called the M4P Hub. There's, there's lots of these things that are happening, and we want to showcase some of these successful partnerships at the Mexico event as well. Thanks. Oh, I like that. So I tell you how keen people are to knowledge share. Sometimes they give me their business card before we even start and tell me that they have something to share with us. So I know you have a microphone. Will you introduce yourself? And um, um, what did you want to add to our conversation? Right, good afternoon. My name is Moon Jung Cha. I'm a senior advisor to Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Strategy and Finance of Korea. I'm really pleased to be here and I enjoy you know, listening to all the conversations that I can. And um, I have three points to, to briefly discuss. The first thing was about the question, you know, uh, what kind of impact uh, you can have from uh, knowledge sharing. So I'll briefly introduce what you have done. You know, Korea started our KSP from 2004. And so far, cumulatively, we have been working together with about 150 countries with more than 460 topics. And then uh, about them, you know, if I introduce some of our you know, tangible results, that is about Dominican Republic. We have been working together with Dominican Republic for uh, three years until last year. And then, you know, they were interested in export-oriented economic development policy. So we shared our experience, and we helped them to establish Exim Bank, Export Import Bank of Dominican Republic. And we also suggest to build a trade center in Dominican Republic. And lastly, we introduced e-custom system to the country. So now the country has really good export-oriented policies and financial support for exporters and trade centers, and also they have very efficient e-custom system. So I'm sure that this is kind of the you know, very effective result of knowledge sharing for some specific countries. And we have a lot of results like that, but because of the time limit, I think I have to stop here for that. Are and there any challenges? Are there any, any difficulties? Because you make it sound like it's working so well. All right. And as and and as, as Eric pointed out, it's like, well, you okay. can share really bad knowledge just because you're sharing. It doesn't That's mean it's right. great. Yep. Probably, you know, there are some difficulties as well. However, we try to avoid this, avoid or overcome the kind of difficulties. You know, first of all, what <laughs> you have didn't done. prepare the difficulties for me, did you? <laughs> no, only the success stories. Right. <laughs> well, I'm talking about the problems, and I'm, I'm talking about how to overcome that kind of problem. The first thing we should do is that we always include our regional expert. That is the first thing we should do. And second one, we are not uh, working alone. We always invite local consultant or local expert in that country. So we make a team together, 
And we try to understand that country's situation and try to introduce the right policy. And then you may ask, you know, do you always have a good policies? Of How did not. you know that? <laughs> That's spooky. <laughs> of course not. You know, Korea, you know, the one of the many reasons that Korea is a very interesting country to be a, your knowledge sharing partner is that we made a lot of mistakes and failures as well as success. For example, you know, we had the wrong policies for heavy and chemical industry drive in the mid-1970s. And we try to explain in our partner countries that the industrial policy is not always very beneficial. Many times that is very hazardous or harmful. So we, we ask them, you know, we explain them, persuade them to avoid this kind of problem. And that's the thing you know, I would like to say about you know, our problems. And about you know, the logistics or mechanism of a broker, brokerage of knowledge. Well, so far we are inventing many different types of knowledge sharing okay. logistics. All right, so I'm going to thank you for your contribution because sure. there are about 20 people in this room okay, who's like, you. enough of the success stories, I have questions. Thank sure. you, I really appreciate that contribution thank because you. I always want to hear good stories as well, which is great. Right. Let me just check in with the panel because I did say, did you have anything that you actually wanted to check in with each other about? Oh, were you okay? You're just ready to, to answer all the questions as they come around the room. Okay, you look like you're in good shape. Okay, who do we have? Okay, there, right. and then we go back to that corner. Yes, my name is Zakaria El Gumir. I work for the Organization for American State. Uh, I'm in charge of a, uh, a new platform uh, based on existing platform called the Inter-American Cooperation Network, which basically tries to share solutions and match make the, the demand and the offer of these different solutions. We hear a lot about knowledge sharing, sharing knowledge, best practices, good practices. Reality is that, uh, is this a new trend, a new w word of technical assistance? I think it is very important that we, we try to define. This came in another conversation, uh, in another uh, uh, workshop that was held here two days ago. But it's very important that we define knowledge sharing. If I'm a country we're trying to get the best practices, I want to look at what are the good practices. What are, is good practices is the same as knowledge sharing? What is the differences? Is this a new trend? I think it's very important that we make this mechanism very in, understandable by, by those that, that are trying to get there in the world or many solutions. Again, I'm going to say the same comment I mentioned two days ago, is that we, we are talking about knowledge sharing for development. The focus is very important for, on development. We're talking also about the importance of putting the countries in the driver's seat. Yes, but we're not going to give a Ferrari to a country that with, with, you know, with, with all the tools, but at the same time, we're not going to give a van to a country with many solutions and tell them, go and adapt these solutions to, to your reality if the country doesn't have a system to adapt or to learn on how to create those priori priorities for, for, for their own countries. Thank so you, you made a really good point. I could see people from the Global Partnership actually writing down notes as you were saying that. What exactly, as you're leaving this room, what exactly do you need to know next? Because come next year in Mexico, we want you to be there and be part of this partnership. So what do you need, what do you need next? You know, one thing that I think we need is to, uh, there is, the World Bank Institute uh, developed a very great mechanism, the art of knowledge. It's very important to also share it with other multilaterals or other institutions that are also doing the same thing. I know that the UN has something called uh, the, the, the Office of the, the on South South Cooperation, where also they talked almost the same thing about how we, we match demand and offer and they have different solutions and how to attract these solutions from the academia, from a different perspective. I would like to have Mexico as a place where the different actors who are key for development uh, understand where are we going, understand this global agenda for, for cooperation for development. I think it's very important that also we, 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 and it has been done after Busan, to refocus the work not on the aid perspective but on cooperation because cooperation is key. It's very important that a country feel that they're, they're in part of the cooperation. They're in the driver's seat, they're creating their own system to say, you know, we're not just receiving aid, but we're cooperating with the country, even if the, uh, the country from the north could be finding that. There's different mechanisms, triangular, south, south, and all these mechanisms right. need to be understood and simplified for the rest to understand what is the global agenda, what is the post-MDGs gonna look like. Sure. It's very important to benchmark them also and not to keep it open as it was pre uh, uh, MDGs before they were created. And the benchmarking is very key also for, for prioritizing and use what happened, what works, the solution that works on MDGs to move forward. Okay, all right. So 
Um, we are going to that corner, but first, Eric, you look like you had some thoughts going on there. Uh, you, you are brilliant looking into people's <laughs> body language, fantastic. Yeah, I, I have a very concrete suggestion, which I think will strengthen this agenda, and that is to make the way we are counting development assistance and partnership more fair. And let me be very practical to, to underline uh, the point. Let's assume that someone wants to share knowledge with Myanmar. Let's assume that Indonesia is doing that, sending some experts to say the uh, Minister of Finance in Myanmar. Let's assume Korea are doing the same, and let's assume that my country, Norway, is doing the same. Uh, the, be the benefit, as it will be counted today, the Norwegian contribution will be at least five times the Indonesian, beca simply because the salaries of the Indonesian expert will be much lower than the salary of the Norwegian expert. The Korean expert will probably be in, the in between. So for exactly the same sharing of information, we may also argue that the Indonesian or Korean experience is much more relevant to the circumstances of Myanmar. But if Norway, Myan uh, Indonesia, and Korea share uh, knowledge with, uh, with, uh, with Myanmar, the Norwegian will be counted as five times, the Korean probably as three times, and the Indonesian at one times uh, for exactly the same. That is not fair and it gives much less prestige and, uh, uh, and uh, showcasing uh, of South-South uh, cooperation than it deserves. We must reform it. All right, so I know we have a question here. Can you also, oh, and Gargi has a question there. Do you want to just jump off the back of it? Is it, um, okay, so Gargi has a question here. And then also put more hands up, because we're good, very good, 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 good. Okay, great, let's start over here. Hi, um, Gregory Adams from, from Oxfam, uh, and it, this is a very, interesting conversation. I appreciate how um, each of the panelists and some of the other people around the room are, are, are working to actually share knowledge. But what's where I'm kind of left cold by this conversation and where I'm hoping, you know, we can push the conversation to go is how each of your institutions are actually able to integrate knowledge that comes at you that you might have not been expecting or might have not been prepared to integrate. And I, I want to give a specific example from Haiti, uh, because Haiti was brought up before. In fact, the bulk of Haitians don't earn their livelihoods from the garment industry. Uh, most Haitians earn their livelihood from agriculture, from farming. Uh, we recently saw an example in Haiti where, the, uh, where USAID was implementing a big agriculture investment project through a contractor. Um, they spoke to the head of the local uh, Farmers Association. The Farmers Association said, our storage needs for, for the bean harvest is 45 metric tons in aggregate of all the farmers here. So that got put back into the contractor's log frame. They, they, based on the bin size that they had, that meant 31 bins. 31 bins were delivered. The farmers were called, here, come pick up your bins in town. These bins were so big that they would have, they would have held the, f the harvest of five, five average harvests of each of these farmers. Not only that, the bins were so big they couldn't actually transport them to their farms. And the contractor's response was, you said your storage needs were 45 metric tons. We gave you 45 metric tons of storage, therefore we've done our job. And they had no way of actually integrating the fact that these farmers were telling them this is not what we need. Now the point here is not to beat up on USAID. Uh, you know, we're, we actually work very closely with them and we're, we're impressed by the way that they're actually trying to grapple with this challenge. But we're repeatedly struck by the fact that if we're really talking about sharing knowledge, too many development institutions, whether they're governments, whether they're, uh, whether they're donor governments, partner country governments, or even uh, INGOs, we need to shine the light on ourselves too, okay. are sometimes incapable All right, of actually good. integrating that knowledge. How are we actually, how are you guys actually changing your institutions to be able to hear and integrate the knowledge when it comes to you? All right, uh, interesting question and, and vividly uh, illustrated. Phil, when um, that question started about integrated knowledge, your eyebrow went up. Um, <laughs> so I think I'm going to ask you about that because it really is a tricky question. You, you, you mentioned earlier, even can we get South-South cooperation? Do countries want to do it? And then there's this other issue about, well, how do you integrate too? Yes, well, the, the example of Haiti, it's, uh, it's always uh, 
concerning us because Haiti is such a tough cookie. I mean, it is not that you do the things integrating or not. Uh, we have weak institutions. Uh, we don't have an ownership, and usually that ownership is taken by other actors which are not the local people. Uh, and I think in Haiti that you already expressed some examples, and I think we have many of those, and what you are now saying is actually one that has some solutions. Uh, how to integrate it? And that's the question that you were raising. Um, I believe the integration, it's first, it has to come from a local perspective. Here, the question was already raised, how do we get it down to the sub-national level? And I believe that the information and actually the knowledge sharing should start from the bottom-up uh, approach, because there we have the possibility to actually integrate it correctly. Because the, the persons that are actually working on it are usually uh, top-down approaches, and it's not working. So I believe if we can integrate it, we can do it uh, with local experts and then go on uh, with it. I hope that at least I answer some of the concerns there. I also think looking at Haiti, that's an example of traditional aid gone wrong, and that maybe knowledge sharing and South-South cooperation might be a better solution, like when uh, Yundri was saying that we work with other countries where our cultural um, similarities make sense. So it makes sense for those two to match up. Anyway, what do I know? Gargi. Um, I, I'm struck that some of the most successful examples we heard today that we always talk about are the bilateral uh, sharing of knowledge, so oil for, get, for development, um, South Korea with Dominican Republic. These are terrific examples, but given where we're sitting, I also wonder what's, what can an intermediary do to help? What needs to be built in the middle to have more of this, if anything? Uh, and and what, what does that future look like? Are you considering yourself an intermediary? Yeah, what could we do to help make broker more of the knowledge sharing? <laughs> Sanjay. So uh, speaking on behalf of the World Bank uh, and what we can do, we are trying to do three things to, to help broker this at scale. The first is we have actually made it, because we have a huge number of operations in so many countries, so the question is, we are trying to introduce for the first time this year, it's already been introduced, uh, an actual indicator which tracks the extent to which our operations are integrating knowledge sharing. So it's in each of the operational vice presidencies accountability index, how much knowledge sharing they actually did. And going back to our colleague's uh, point, it is actually, this is, a, this is actually an accountability metrics that's being introduced in this, and, and there's more I can say about this, but this is actually, we have, the second thing I just wanted to mention is that we have created a trust fund, which actually Ngozi created, which is a very interesting trust fund because it has more developing country donors than it has uh, uh, rich country donors. Uh, and there are lots around the table who are actually donors to the South-South facility. And it actually f uses the platform of the World Bank to finance South-South exchanges on demand. And this is the way we have uh, used the multilateral platform to finance 136 exchanges from 80 countries, right? So these are ways in which you can actually um, use the, the financing and operations of the World Bank Group to share knowledge and connect knowledge from one to the other. And you can do this at scale. I'm going to do Mauricio and then Philip. Yes, thank you. I just want to react to the point of if uh, knowledge sharing is substituted in aid. Uh, not at all. Uh, aid is extremely vital and will remain to be vital uh, for many countries. But uh, I think that what the conversation is telling us is that we are talking about a, a new level of international cooperation for development, a broader uh, way of understanding uh, cooperation for development. And that includes not only financial resources, but also uh, the, the, the capacities in terms of knowledge, in terms of institutions that all of us have in different levels. And this transfer of resources and knowledge uh, will have uh, uh, different levels and different actors. And an important actor, as it was mentioned before, is uh, the middle income countries and uh, uh, countries that can uh, um, contribute with their uh, knowledge in a relevant and contextualized way. So there is a unique value added uh, uh, to build triangular uh, uh, cooperation by which uh, the relevant expertise 
is put into place. And we, I think that one, one thing that we have to work on is to have a good catalog of expertise of countries and a, a, a good way to devise projects to utilize this expertise. And of course, uh, it is easy to say, but it's a, a big enterprise that in, in which we all have to put uh, extra efforts. Philip. To the comment of the gentleman, and actually seeing how we can have evidence-based policy making for decision makers, because he ha we have several ministers sitting on the table and decision takers. What do you actually need from knowledge hubs to take better decisions? Uh, because it is not only knowledge sharing, it is taking that knowledge in order to take better decisions and policy decisions. So I would be very interested to actually know how they could integrate it into their uh, decision process. We have one minister left. <laughs> well, th that's enough for me. The uh, question can only be to you. OK, I think uh, this works two way. Uh, in the case of Indonesia, not only for Indonesia to share its experiences in certain uh, policies or, 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 or programs, such as poverty alleviation that I mentioned earlier. But likewise, Indonesia could learn from its peers, for example, uh, we have one specific program, which is uh, the condi conditional cash transfer, which we learn from, uh, I believe, uh, Brazil, yeah? uh, uh, Brazil and Mexico. But we uh, did not uh, take it as is, yeah, uh, just uh, and then implement it in Indonesia. But we, we the so-called best fit it to the Indonesian case. So this is maybe just an example of a concrete. Uh, concrete uh, program or activities that, that we already did. So I know we have a question here, sir, on the table, but I know, Eric, you have something to add, but Eric, I want you to add it quickly because we've heard your voice, but I haven't heard that voice. Oh, that was very good of you. No, you have to talk now because I can't, I don't know what you were going to say and it's going to bug me. The, the most important after this would be, be you doing knowledge sharing or how you read people's body language, etc. That would be very, <laughs> very, very, very interesting. <laughs> Uh, ju just to say, there is no way we can do this without aid, because th there is a cost always in knowledge sharing. And if, say, Mexico is sharing knowledge with, say, Haiti or El Salvador, there is a cost, and that will have to be paid either by Mexico or by, or by some uh, uh, other partner. So it's not a replacement for aid. It's nothing, n nothing principal new either. But th what, what is really new is the rise of the South all those success stories in developing countries which need to be shared because then you can avoid mistakes and if you allow me one final comment what's also new is that we are living in the time of pragmatism because the ideologies of the past did not were not successful nearly all successful governments today are pragmatist looking for what works and then you do more of that avoiding mistakes if you learn and learning from mistakes and let me quote at the end that, that's the spirit of the age, and we, we should do it. That's the Prime Minister of Singapore, uh, Mr. Lee. He was asked, what, what is the ideology of Singapore? And he said, we have just one ideology. It's not communism, for sure, nor is it socialism, nor is it liberalism, nor is it conservatism. We have just one ideology, that is pragmatism. We learn from mistakes, and we learn from successes, and we should do that conversation at a global scale, and that's what this knowledge sharing is about. It's never too late to bring a new voice into the conversation, a new voice. So, sir, introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, I'm Steve Groff from the Asian Development Bank. Um, and this is an interesting discussion, I, and, and, and I agree, Eric, with your, uh, your, your acknowledgement that more interesting, perhaps, than I thought it was when I came in. Um, but I think one, one challenge that we have is that in this milieu, there are some inefficiencies that, that we need to, to, to think about. And I think about those inefficiencies in two ways. First, we've talked a lot about, about supply-driven types of approaches to this, which I think continues to be a bit of a challenge. I, I take, Sanjay, your point about how we're trying to grapple with that, but I still think there's a lot of supply-driven approaches that are employed. And second, I think there's a, almost a lack of competition um, in the supply. Of, of uh, knowledge and in the market for knowledge. And so if we could figure out how do we incorporate some basic market principles in this, I think we might end up with better outcomes and we might avoid some of the challenges that, that Eric articulated earlier. And so I think, and, and also using, going back to Eric's example of, you know, of Myanmar and, you know, being approached by, 
by Norway, Korea, and Indonesia. The truth is, is that Myanmar doesn't really have a choice when it comes there. They're going to, I mean, there, there's a bilateral relationship that Myanmar wants to maintain, so they're going to take in that from all three of those people or all three of those countries, and they're not really going to say, well, which makes the best sense for me? They're going to feel obligated to take all of that and not really have a mechanism for comp competing to find what the best solution is, but also when we think more lar largely about the brokers of knowledge, how do we put competition in there to produce better solutions? And one last point that we haven't touched on is are we really take are we really acknowledging the way that learning has changed and the way that information exchange has changed um, over the last 10 or 15 years, and how are we incorporating that in how we're thinking about these kind of knowledge solutions? So that's it. Thank you. So, Steve, from the Asian Development Bank, is this a partnership that you want to be part of? Um, sure. We do a lot of work in this. I don't think that we have the answers uh, at all, and we're certainly in, you know, happy to be engaged in discussions on how we might get better at all this. That makes sense. So there's a lot of pressure always on the last question of the forum, of the conversation, because it means it has to be relevant and brilliant and inspiring and brief. No pressure. That's a tall order. Um, uh, Magdi Amin from IFC. I, actually, it's related to the last comment. I, you know, taking an analogy from finance, you know, at, at early stages we put a lot of money in a lot of projects, but it's really when you see signs of success, they don't need less, but they need more finance. And so, in the case of knowledge, it's really I'd like to know, or at least perhaps put on the table for for the future, how do we make sure that the projects that are starting to su succeed really get more attention and really break through the issues that usually don't emerge until after you've started to work on and have some initial success. Um, secondly, I just wanted to also put on the table that we need to share knowledge not only on the technical matter but on the politics of reform because it's really sometimes the vested interests in the status quo that are the most difficult and where we really need to share and in fact us as multilaterals are not the best equipped. I think the bilaterals have a much stronger role to play on the politics of reform. So I hope that was brief enough. Thanks. That's beautifully brief. I don't know how you know the problems before they happen. I mean, if we did, we wouldn't be sitting here and the world would be perfect. The second one, Sanjay? Second part of that? Actually, I, I'm, I'm trying to take both of the points in very quick way. I, I think... Um, you know, there was a sense in which knowledge sharing at a superficial level is like an appetizer. You just sort of hear what someone else had done and you're inspired by it and it's like a Google thing. You know, you, you find out, aha, this is good. But the question takes us deeper to say beyond that, when you're actually doing implementation, how do you actually have that depth of implementation knowledge? And the depth of implementation knowledge is often not about technocratic things. It's about how did you manage the political economy of reforms? And I think that is where knowledge sharing can be really powerful because it is practitioners talking to other practitioners, not so much about technocratic widgets that you can learn online, but about that deep tacit knowledge of how did you grapple, how when you were hit, you know, when you were implementing and some vested interest came and attacked you or you had this kind of a problem, how did you do this? And it's that deep implementation knowledge sharing, which I think is very powerful, which you won't get from the World Bank, which you won't get from uh, technical assistance experts in answer to the other question. You get it from other practitioners who have gotten their hands dirty to do it. And that's the promise, that's the inspiration of knowledge exchange. So I have three minutes to share between us. So Vice President, you have a minute, I have a minute, and Minister Alashabana, you have a minute as well. So we're gonna be very efficient. I actually want to ask you something that has been bugging me for a while, Vice President, and that is the whole reason for South-South cooperation, the idea of knowledge sharing, is because traditional institutions like the World Bank they're traditional, and countries want to do it for themselves. Why on earth would the World Bank want to be involved in this partnership? Partnerships like this are designed to get away from the World Bank. I think, I think uh, our interest is development results. And the traditional development model of which the World Bank, when it was created, was part, was based on a north to south transfer of money 
with associated conditionalities. And that's a very arcane model, which has to give way to a modern model, where 50, 60 years into independence of countries, many of these countries, Indonesia, Korea, India, Brazil, Mexico, many others, are very successful in many other aspects. If we are interested in development results, and not in the sustenance of our institution or a traditional model. We need to connect practitioners one to another who have actually met with success because that deep practical implementation knowledge is what other countries need in order to get better success. And we are sitting here and about to go into the development committee lunch where we are going to be discussing what is the strategy to end poverty faster and boost shared prosperity. And the strategy to end poverty faster and boost shared prosperity must include a huge element of countries learning from one another. So therefore, the World Bank traditional model has to evolve and disrupt the traditional view that somehow we have the knowledge to being a connector, a much humbler connector and broker of knowledge amongst countries. So that's part of the evolution of the World Bank. And so, for some closing remarks, uh, Minister Ali Shavala, Minister of National Development Planning in Indonesia, said she didn't need more than a minute. I love that. Uh, on behalf of the Global Partnership, I would like to say thank you very much for your active participation, your inputs. Uh, I'm sure it would be very uh, valuable for the team, yeah, team of Global Partnership to prepare uh, leading up to the Mexico 2014. Uh, just, uh, I, I would like to... Uh, uh, to say the three points that I jotted down yeah, uh, when I'm uh, following the discussion. First is there seems to be a really genuine interest in this knowledge sharing initi initiatives. Already many in practice. Uh, there is some understanding, however, however concrete examples and successful results seem to help. Second, uh, how to scale up in a more systematic manner. Uh, there is this, you know, the issue of supply side, uh, which uh, we can build from existing platform, and then also the demand side, which is also very important, uh, based on countries' need and interest. And last, uh, we need to focus more on the cooperation, not only on the funding, and learn from the best practices, from the lessons learned, from the good examples, as well as the bad experiences. Thank you very much. I also have to thank the panel. You were brilliant. Thank you very, very much. It was nice to be able to see the whites of your eyes from this side of the room. Thank you to everybody who took part in the conversation for listening so attentively. This global partnership is really young. It's very new. It will work because of your involvement. I'm already a fan and a fan for three reasons. The partnership means that low-income countries are now becoming mid-income countries. That's a great thing. It means that these countries want to work together and support each other. That is a fantastic thing. And the third is lunch is about to be served. And I, for one, are very grateful about that. Thank you for your company. Thank you for giving us your Saturday. My name is Femi Okay. Thank you.